Hey there, a few weeks ago I talked to Norbert and uh, was on his podcast, the first episode of his podcast, Inside the Project. The podcast is out, apparently. I'm not a podcast guy, so I can't tell you if it's uh, like like where exactly to get it, but uh, but it's out there. So if you're into podcasts, you can just search for it and you can hear me talk very poorly for an hour. Uh, for the people who are not into podcasts I don't and don't have like me apps for podcasting, you can actually watch the podcast in this video. I asked uh, Norbert to give me the the file of you know the video recording of our talk, and so that's what we're gonna show uh, in like five, four, three, two, one. Thanks, Norbert, for having me, first of all. Uh, and Giant Robot Game is my second game that I'm hoping to publish, uh, uh, well, soonish. And it, it is about, uh, well, it plays as a, um, as, let's say, Diablo. You know, like you see your big giant robot, that's you, uh, and you're fighting other giant robots. And you see it from the top, and it's tactical. And um, I clearly have still problems explaining how, what exactly it is uh, because I don't have like the elevator pitch for it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a two D simulation of giant robot battles. That's that's what it is. I think the giant robot co part is very good, very <laughs> well encapsulated. Yes. Um, so how? Did you kind of start with the project? What kind of led up to you starting to work on Giant Robot Game? Giant Robot Game. Well, I actually have to to kind of give you a winding answer because it starts with the previous game, uh, which is the Knights of San Francisco, which is a very different genre. It was like a text uh, RPG game for mobile. Uh, turn-based, everything is like everything is different. But uh, the the idea of that game and also Giant Robot game is that I like games that are playgrounds and that give you stories to tell. Like the one of the mm -hmm. coolest things that I can think of from when I was a kid, uh, but also from now is when I say like, hey, like I did this in a game, it was cool, or um, even not just with games, like someone plays with Lego and something happens during mm -hmm. that, and uh, that's and that's cool. Instead of a story that is inside the game, you know? So like, I like stories that you create yourself. Well, and with Knights of San Francisco, I thought, okay, so there's all these uh, tabletop, uh, role-playing games, right? Like Dungeons and Dragons and all all this. And in the, let's say, 80s, people started converting them to computers, uh, clearly, because it, it was kind of like an obvious choice. If you're playing, I don't know, do you play Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that? Have you played any I've of played that? I've played it before a few times, but I wasn't really into that for too long, but yeah, I've played it a few times. Yeah, yeah. So you you know, like it's I'm not also playing it like that now, but like the the idea of sitting around a table and telling a story that comes from some kind of a system or like some kind of rules uh, is very appealing to me, and it's also very um, well, very new in in a sense. And um, but you know, if you think about the 1980s and the Dungeons and Dragons of that era, uh, all the tabletop role-playing games were very math heavy. And mm -hmm. so it made sense to convert the math into computer games, right? So from that era on, I think we have these role-playing games that are very heavily into, um, into numbers. So like, uh, and again, I'm I'm going to talk about games that you may not know or may know. I don't know, but like Skyrim, right, or mm -hmm. something like this. You have someone with strength forty and agility thirteen, and then you have the hit points, and you, you know it's it's a math uh, game, yep. which is great, and I love it. But 
But it's not the same as a tabletop RPG, especially the modern ones, where where the fights are not like I take 15 hit points from your 20, uh, mm -hmm. but fights are more like I slash your hand and now you, <laughs> uh, you know, either your hand is uh, detached from your body or at least you dropped your sword or whatever, right? Uh, and I think that's closer to how we like to talk about, it's more realistic, but it's also... Uh, closer to how we talk about combat and, and just generally everything, right? We're not, we're not like, well, uh, he he was in a bar fight and got th thirteen punches <laughs> in the head, uh, but uh, even if he did, but but what we talk about is like, yeah, he was fighting and then the last punch was like right into the eye and then he fell down and so on. So that was the idea of Knights of San Francisco, trying to make a game where you have fights that are like that. Uh, and also like uh, you can just walk around the very small environment that I prepared for the people and be pretty open in what to do there. Uh, but like when you are fighting and when you are interacting, it's more about these like big um meaningful changes to the game world instead of just like doing some uh, math changes to to some stat or or something like this right mm -hmm. well and then after i i finished knights of san francisco i kind of hated it uh like like really like i was it was we can talk about this later but i was completely just over it uh after <laughs> spending many years on on working on it i really didn't want to th think or read or anything about it anymore uh but i still kind of th this idea of of these games percolated and i was still thinking okay what's next uh it should be something different uh and then i realized i still like the idea of like uh, let's say you know shooting someone's leg and then the person will not be able to use the leg. Uh, the, but of course, it, this works in fantasy uh, when you have like necromancers, like in Knights of San Francisco, uh, but it doesn't work in like any realistic, uh, lo you know, topic. Like you can, if, if someone shoots your leg, you just go down, that's it. Uh, but it does work when you have giant robots. So, sorry for the long-winded way, but but th that's basically how I I how how I thought about okay. So like if you have giant robots now, you suddenly again can have like a, almost like a realistic world, but in that game it still can be a fight between let's say two robots and they exchange mm -hmm. fire or whatever. But then one of them loses an arm. Uh, and the other one takes the arm and then does something with this, and that, that's kind of the, the that's the kinds of stories that I love to uh, to enable. That's a very interesting backstory to it. Yeah, I think like a lot of games try to emulate you being able to do a lot of things, like they implement features for interacting with pets and different things. Um, but it's like really hard to allow people to do all the things because first off, you as a game designer need to make sure that all the things kind of work together. Like people cannot just abuse this one system to destroy everything else. And on the other hand, you have to implement all of this. So how did you deal with like the millions of possibilities? I remember back in the day, I played through Knights of San Francisco. It was a really fun experience. Thanks. And I... Yeah, I noticed there's a lot of different things you could do. How do you deal? How did you deal with, and how are you dealing with all those possibilities from a technical perspective and also from like a game design perspective? Yeah, yeah, it, this is really hard, and this is basically what I struggle with, and the reason that giant robot game is still in development and not already out there, uh, because I, I'm the kind of game designer that is also a game developer and I like to, talk, to, to work on things that are complex and systemic, um, you know, 
Uh, there's definitely there, there are great games that are not systemic at all, uh, and and I love to play them, uh, but I just don't want to build them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, so this is a constant struggle. Like like I know in both the games, uh, Giant Robot game and Knights of San Francisco, that I could have made them like simpler, uh, but I didn't. Uh, but what I what I had to understand after like six years of working on Knights of San Francisco is that it's like at some point you have to be harsh. And uh, so the only reason I actually finished and published the game was that I started writing down all the things that I want in the game, but also basically being a product manager about it, like saying like, okay, so this will take this much of time, this much of time, and then projecting towards like how long would it take uh, to, to to actually finish the game that I want to finish. And I saw like, you know, another three years at least <laughs> with just the things that I had in mind. And so I had to cut. And, but, and when, and I also had to, and this is like a big point for me, I had to commit. Like you, 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 there's very easy for in game development and any other project to just say to just drop it. You know, to to be like, oh, this was an interesting learning experience. I learned a lot, blah blah blah. Uh, but I'm not gonna finish it. But here I said, no, 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 I'm totally gonna finish it. And so I had to start dropping. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I certainly did dropping to a bunch of times. I started so many games with this grandiose idea of it's going to be obviously an open world MMO, whatever. Yes. And after some point, it's like, okay, I mean, good progress, but to finish this, it's going to take this amount of time and that's just not feasible. Um, but going back to kind of um, this committing and um, working on a project, did you do any prototyping for uh, Knights of San Francisco, like, did you have like a very first version where it was, you have this idea and you had something finished you gave to your friends or family to to test? Ah, yeah, that's that's the best scenario, right? Like, if you can mm -hmm. uh, have something to to give to someone to play, uh, I have a, I try to do this a lot. Like right now, I just I just did this, like sending the playtest to to some people with gender boot game but that's still very late that much later than normally right like normally people who make games will make something in a week and then they will play this that and that and if that doesn't work then they won't continue right uh well i have like the the games i want to make are like very systemic and they just mm -hmm. don't work they just don't okay. work for years uh, mm -hmm. And then they do, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so uh, if I I did have like the first weekend I, I I remember the first weekend I worked on Knights of San Francisco I had something that you could play uh, because it's really like a text game right so so like why not uh, but it made no sense to to test it with anyone because it didn't do anything right. Uh, so I had to start you know, implementing all these systems that interacted, and then when they start interacting, then it makes an interesting experience, I think. But but before that, no. Um, uh, with Giant Robot Game, it's kind of similar. I I could have made something a, a lot sooner, and I and I kind of did, uh, but uh, but but then like the. I think the appeal of the game is really in the systems and how everything, you know, like you uh, put a, a forest on fire and then the things uh, in it overheats and explodes mm -hmm. and, you know, all, all the things that you have to implement all of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that said, like, I, for example, I really like in game development um, to go to meet apps of game developers and show the show of an early version to a game developer there. The reason I do this is that first of all, it's like they're not your friend, or like they're friend, but but they're not like you know family and friends that that always tell you, yeah, this is great. Um, so they can be a little more harsh, which is good. 
second, uh, they see past the things that are undone or not done yet, you know? So mm -hmm. while a normal gamer will look at a game and they, they will be like, oh, it's too gray or whatever. It, you don't want to like you you can hear that but it's not really important for you in like the first two weeks of of your development so a game developer knows how a, an early game looks like so they can be like yeah i, I get that this is terrible uh but that's fine like i yeah. i also have games like that uh but they immediately talk about mechanics and, and things like that oh, and yeah. of course uh, for yeah, in, in a way, it was interesting because I had a version of the game that was very fun but very actiony. Uh, it was like uh, you know, uh, like when in games you can strafe, you can just like mm -hmm. instead of going straight in towards the enemy, you go in a different direction and then shoot in that direct in onto the enemy, and then that way you uh, get less hit. Um, so that worked really well at some point because I didn't have a targeting computer implemented, right? <laughs> and, and so, like, the the, uh, the enemies were really stupid. They would just shoot at where you were uh, at mm -hmm. the time. And so that was a very effective strategy, which made it very fun because you were, like, you know, going around in places, but also made it really shallow. Like, you would just, just go in, around in circles. That's it, you know? Maybe there would be like more enemies on more sides and then it would be harder, but still shallow. So I thought, no, um, I, I'm not going to go that way. And so like, I made it purposefully less fun <laughs> uh, uh, by like implementing like a, an actual targeting computer, which was also a lot of work, but also fun work. Um, uh, but yeah, it, 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 had, uh, it had to go the way that I like to go, which is simulation. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. So also talking about the um, going to meetups, I was at a game development meetup the other day and I didn't present anything. I just was there as a listener and visitor. Um, but there were a couple of people um, showcasing their game. And it was this one game in particular that was really interesting. It looked very, very basic, like it was done in a week. And it was like, if you really think about games and compare it to, I don't know, Skyrim, GTA, whatever, obviously it was nowhere near that was very simple, but it was kind of was starting to be fun. So I told them that, it's, yeah, this needs a lot of polishing to actually, I don't know, um, be fun for, for some time, but this is a great start. And I think if you did some development, you can kind of see where the fun started. I think we chatted about that briefly a couple of months ago where I was asking, how do you determine what is actually th uh, fun? Because I think in comparison to, for example, a website or an app, that tries to solve a very particular problem. It's very easy to determine, okay, this solves a problem. It may not look pretty, it may not be fast, it may not be even good, but it ha it solves this issue. But with games, what is the issue? The issue is fun, and how do you solve fun? There are so many aspects of it, I feel like. There's sure. graphics, there's smoothness, there's uh, interaction, all those different things. So I feel like prototyping games can be especially hard too because there's so many more factors to keep in. So I think that's a very good piece of advice to kind of talk to experienced people who kind of know what's if, if something has potential or if something is like, well, good try, but maybe maybe do something else. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you're making a great point because um, I also I remember the reason I started going to game development meetups was when I was still in Silicon Valley. Uh, there were a lot of meetups there, and some of them are game developer meetups. And the way they did it was great because in it was like they had no program; it was just people meeting at a bar with their mm. games and just showing to each other, right? Uh, it's a very, it's a different culture, uh, like the in in America, in I think in Central Europe, it would uh, work less well because we're kind of shy and nobody wants to start <laughs> speaking and showing off their stuff. In the US, it's kind of natural to just like go and, hey, like, look at my stuff. Uh, and, and that's great, I think. Um, and I remember... Uh, I think the first time I, I, I was on such a meetup, I didn't have a game, um, but I looked 
at someone's game that was a platformer, right? And this person, like, didn't understand that uh, they wanted the platformer to be pure, um, I think, uh, but pure from the programming perspective. Remember, this is mm. Silicon Valley. Uh, <laughs> but, but like, so they were like, well, the platformer needs to be like super responsive and like th there needs to be no mass, no momentum for to for the player and so on and so forth. And by looking at that and playing his game, I realized how, you know, games are lies. <laughs> they, oh, yeah. They're like good <laughs> games. The, the way that, uh, for example, you know, Super Mario is fun mm -hmm. or whatever, um, Celeste is fun is because it lies to you all the time. It, it makes all these exceptions to physics um, oh, yeah. that make it so much better and so much more fun to play, you know? And I, I realize I do this even with my game, like Giant Robot Game, which is a simulation. I, I still say I still say it's simulation, even though it's, you know, futuristic, blah, 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 um, and 2D. But it, 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 you know, it, it's it's a simulation. But I still do things like, okay, I'm not implementing the physics the way physics actually work. Mm -hmm. uh, I do them a little differently. Like I kind of help things to look nice and and yeah. fun. You know, like uh, one one of the things that I I do, and that's clearly not from my head, but uh, uh, is that when you have an explosion. Explosions are fun, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so explosions, uh, kind of like, almost like teleport. Um, if uh, like, you can see this also in other games, where where the explosion starts growing, and normal physics would just say they start growing and growing, and then they dissipate. But instead, the the explosion starts growing and then kind of jumps into a bigger explosion, like almost like from one frame to another. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and that somehow makes it much more impactful and interesting. And it's, it has nothing to do with actual oh, yeah. physics and reality, <laughs> but it's, it's fun. So, so yeah, the, I, I don't know, like, of course, I don't know if, um, like how to, how to make games actually fun. Uh, I, I don't think anybody knows, uh, but as you said, it's really important to start with, uh, a prototype and talking to people, showing it to people, letting them play. Um, uh, yeah. Ideally, if you don't have like a systemic game, <laughs> because, yeah. Just uh, to, to get back to the quote of what makes a game fun, I read a very fun thing the other day on the in internet where um, the game kind of encapsulates, it tries to take something and take tries to take the funnest part out of it. What I mean by that, there's a lot of games in the simulation area where it's like you can drive a bus, you can fly a plane, you can have your own uh, farm and stuff like this. That's work, kind of. People do that for a living. They get paid for it. They need to do that. And here we are, people play, uh, paying to play a yeah. game where they can work. Why is that? Because those games were able to take this activity, which is... In theory, it's fun, but there's a lot of hard labor. There's a lot of things that are not fun. You have to do, I don't know, your taxes if you want to have a farm. Not right. fun stuff. And those games take the most fun parts, just taking a big vehicle and driving through some cornfield and taking the, the fun bits and pieces from here and there from reality and mashing them all together in this big fun ball, I think. I, I love these games, and I, I like that. Uh, like, so for example, the, the the company that makes uh, truck simulators is mm -hmm. is here in in the Czech Republic, and and they I think they hit like the the ideal scenario where like almost like nobody actually wants to drive trucks. I think like like <laughs> the real the, like the real work is really hard. It's long hours and so on and so forth, uh, but. But there's a nice thing about it where uh, where you just like, you know, that kind of freedom and like you have this big mm -hmm. rig and so on and so forth. But and so I have one of these games, Euro Truck Simulator. And mm -hmm. in that game, you can play it and you just do the routes. But the the fun part is that it's so, so like like you go from, I don't know, Berlin to Munich 
And normally that would be, I don't know, four hours. I don't, I don't actually know, uh, something like that. But there it's like, you know, in 10 minutes you're there, but you see only the cool stuff, you know? So like you just go and, and there's like a junction and, and then, so it's, it's so, as you say, like they take everything else out of it. They just keep the fun part and then, then make it bigger and, and then uh, it works. Um, so, so yeah. And the other part about simulations that I like is, uh, that they kind of let you play in your own, um, on your own, um, uh, instead of pushing you, uh, towards something. So you can kind of relax more easily. Uh, this is why, for example, like flight simulators there, you can just fly around for as long as I want. And when I'm bored, I can just go go away uh there's not it's it's like yeah it's it's relaxing and so um that can be another reason why we play games oh yeah i fully agree i also really like your take on simulation games i'm also a big fan of kind of this whole simulation lego style minecraft do your own thing because for me like a game if there's a story to it it's it's more similar for me at least like a movie or, um, where somebody put a lot of effort in conveying this story, this idea, this emotion. Uh, whereas when I, for example, play games, I would be more interested in what can I as a player kind of create, come up with. I think it's really fascinating also looking at a lot of different games where players just come up with new concepts and things where the developers never thought about and they're mm-hmm. like, okay, that's creative. And I I think that's really, really uh, fun. Um, I, I'm now wondering like, if it's something that could be like almost like a psychological profile, what kind of games you like. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I, I, I think there are, I, I think, for example, if you ask developers about their favorite games, they would often say something like Minecraft or Factorio or mm-hmm. like just things that are kind of systemic and you can play with. Uh, while that I don't think that's like the necessarily the case for everyone else. Although of course Minecraft is very, uh, very, very, um, very popular anyway. But yeah, yeah, I, I like uh, any game. Uh, but it's uh, the the simulation, like kind of the playground or sandbox games, give me more um, just kind of uh, yeah feeling of of play. I guess yeah, more more than just watching something. You're right. Yeah, I totally agree. Talking about games, besides Knights of San Francisco and Giant Robot Games, I know you have had a bunch of smaller projects that were also released. I just replayed the ga- uh, the Lunar Lander game the other day, oh. which I think I played when you first released it, uh, okay. if, if that makes sense. I think I played it before, and I when preparing, I, I looked at your site and was like, oh, I remember this game, and I was like, stuck in there for 20 minutes and trying to land <laughs> like honestly landing okay the lunar lander game it's basically a lunar lander where you have this control of the space keys and you uh, can control the thrust of like this 2d thing and it's kind of doable slash easy if you just want to lift up and uh, go back down but you don't have a lot of time to accomplish these missions and i don't know have you ever achieved going from the far position to like the other side of the map. I tried it so many times and it's so oh, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So yeah, this is another reason you want to uh, test with players because I, the, it was obviously some, some of the missions that it gives you are impossible uh, because I just like randomly put, mm-hmm. you know, things around. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's like, I played it so much that I, I could uh, pretty easily like land it somewhere. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, the the thing was that the reason I made Lender was that uh, actually it was like on a tech demo almost. I wanted a game where if you're like in a, a meeting and you are, you can like <laughs> only, like you clearly can only use 50% of your brain and still be as productive as, as before. Um, you just, want to play something on your in your browser right mm-hmm. uh but you only need to use the because you're on a laptop so uh you you can't use the mouse so basically it was like a 
like uh, what can I make that is a browser game that would be uh, playable on keyboard only on a laptop, uh, would have like very short play sessions, uh, but still be kind of fun and, and replayable. And, and then I realized, well, I, to make it like this, especially like for, for board students, I also <laughs> need to make it very, um, performant. Like, like I, w I can't just redraw normal games, redraw the whole screen, every frame. I can't do that. So like the main innovation, technical innovation of Lander is that I only, I only really like old, like very old games. I only really redraw like a very <laughs> small part of the screen. Everything else is, is static. And so, so that, uh, that made it possible. I don't actually know maybe if, if I use the current tech, uh, it would be just as efficient if I, you know, redrew drew the whole screen every, every time, but back at that point, it was like very, uh, very small like CPU uh, and energy usage and still uh, having a game like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't finish because by doing this route, it was very hard to change anything afterwards. It was like mm -hmm. a pretty complex game for such a simple game mechanic. Um, uh, and so I don't even, yeah, it's it's kind of finished, but, but I wanted a lot more from it and th then I kind of... Uh, uh, kept it in my back pocket and never looked at it again hopefully uh, but i still sometimes think about it because i think it has potential to be like you know like just just a game that you just want to play for for five minutes and then go about your things oh yeah for sure like i really like these small playstations you were able to in theory shut it off after every successful landing but no you want to do one more until until <laughs> yeah. it explodes uh speaking about the tech what did you write it in Oh, Dart, yeah, Dart. Oh, and, it was okay. and, Yeah, yeah, and Canvas. So, so back then there was not really. I mean, it's not that long ago, but but I don't think like the current, you know, WebGL and everything is in mm -hmm. WebGL on on web, uh, and definitely not Wasm or anything like this. Uh, that wasn't the the time for it. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it's like pure Dart and Canvas. Oh wow! Okay, I didn't know. Um. What what kind of different side projects did you have before? What were what is your things that you tried? Yeah, well, I uh, the uh, so Knights of San Francisco came from like a very long uh, development process that started literally eight years before I finished Knights of San Francisco, and it was just um, I was a really big fan of game books. Which were like kind of choose your adventure books uh, with a lot, with some internal mechanics, and uh, and I had an, uh, the idea of uh, bringing them to the mobile phone, which was not very um, how do how do you say it? it? It was not unique. Like a lot of other people had the same idea. They did it much better than I, uh, and I dragged my feet because it was just like something that I did in you know uh, you know on the weekends. Uh, but yeah, like slowly and surely, I started adding more more systems and features to to that, and that's why Nets of San Francisco is is what it is. Um, but yeah, uh, that's uh, that's what I remember about that. I also here's the thing: when you're a software engineer and you're making games, there's you're always on a cliff of becoming a game engine designer <laughs> and yeah and, and a game engine developer and this has been hard on me as well like for example knights of san francisco was supposed to be this huge thing called e-game book which would be like a like a like a sdk basically for making these games it's still mm -hmm. out there it's on github you can use it but it's uh but every time someone says i want to use it i tell them look like i don't i can't even i, I, I don't have time to even like tell you what uh, what to do <laughs> you know there's a readme but that's it uh, you know no no maintenance nothing uh so so uh this is the same with the nice i mean uh, giant robot game where of course uh i could have just used something like unity uh, maybe 
and I, it would probably work uh, as well. Uh, but uh, I wanted to make, you know, I wanted more control. But yeah. it, there's there's a question of like, how much is it about control, and how and how much is it about just like, kind of keeping in your element. Uh, mm -hmm. And for game developers, that's definitely programming. That, that, that's one thing that I always say. Maybe you, you heard me say it uh, before, but but like people love the idea of game design. Like, oh, I'm going to make games because I like game design. But that's the idea of game design is not the reality of game design. Oh, game yeah. design sucks. It's I hate so, game design. Yes, it's so I hard. It. It's so frustrating it's so unknowable like like you know like if you have a problem on a computer and you're a software engineer it can be frustrating but you generally know where to go what to do mm -hmm. uh like you know given enough time you will solve it and generally with all like with some backtracking but not much right mm -hmm. with game design it's very much possible to come up with an idea then work on it for two months and then realizing it sucks and nobody likes it because it's not fun. And there's no way to know before that. And then you can, and also there's no way to know if it's salvageable, if you can like just tweak one little thing and then it immediately makes sense. Or if you have to just like go back to the drawing board. It's just so unknowable and, and so frustrating. And then also there's like all this content generation. It's just like, you know, boring, boring, grinding stuff that's that's game design and so so th people like me will start making a game uh the start is always great because you're the it literally grows under your uh, hands right like like things start work making sense uh you're making a lot of progress every day uh but then once you start uh working on the more you know like Okay, so how do I explain this to the player? How how mm -hmm. do I keep the player entertained for uh, more than five seconds, and so on and so forth? Then it starts hard, and so instead you're like, hmm, maybe I should like maybe the thing that will make this better is if I optimize the marching squares algorithm. Oh, it's <laughs> like yeah. the satisfaction is just so much higher because you can measure it. You you know, okay, yeah. this algorithm takes like. 20 milliseconds and if i do this code change then it will only take 10 milliseconds and it's like there's instant feedback with game design for me also game design did a couple of smaller uh game project and was always sort of with this one big idea like it's gonna be great and why did nobody think of this before and then game design starts and it just tells you nope you can't do this because that doesn't make sense that sucks, uh, that's too, I don't know, too grindy, that's too easy, that's too boring. And in the end, you're, uh, for me at least, a lot of times it was like, okay, I had this unique idea and now I'm kind of stuck with something that feels very mainstream where I don't have to implement it myself because I can just play this other game that doesn't matter. Right. Right. So I, I told you, feel, feel you on this. Yeah, that's my, my favorite anecdote about this is, uh, and th th this is, kind of similar where uh, you have to recognize what's fun for you as a game designer developer and mm -hmm. what's fun for the player right some things are just like inherently fun to work on but mm -hmm. not fun to play and you of course have to make sure that the game is fun to play uh, or interesting to play at least uh, so one one thing like this was um, I think it was like an MMO uh, called Conan I've never mm -hmm. played it but but it was where they realized that, or they had this idea of like, okay, so we have this world, game world, full of creatures and people and so on. So how do we make sure that the creatures behave intelligently? We will, um, we will make a system that simulates the kind of the psychology of basically every <laughs> human being or every, every being. Okay. Uh, the Maslow hierarchy of needs, maybe you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's like the, it's kind of this pyramid where it's like, you know, if you're if you're at the bottom, you, you want to like survive, right? But then if your survivor need is satisfied, then you'll go to like, 
things like, okay, I want to have more food. And at the very top of the pyramid, you have things like self-expression, right? Yeah. So like you're, you're not going to try to like draw Mona Lisa if you're hungry kind of thing. Um, and so, and so, yeah, so they implemented a Maslow's hierarchy of needs wow. in this MMO <laughs> and guess what happens? Nobody cared. No, none, none of the players cared that this, this happens. And instead they just had like this very, very complex thing that was very hard to debug and very hard to, to mm. move. Uh, and the players were not like, did not see any like feature that would come out of it. Because if you if you start working on something like this, you're like, oh, this will be great. We will have all these kind of emergent behaviors of like, you know, I don't know, like a squirrel making Mona Lisa or whatever. I don't know, <laughs> so, something like it's, it sounds mm -hmm. so fascinating. But then in reality, 99.99% of the time, it just works like normal, regular, you know, state machine um, yeah. or at, from the outside. But uh is much more complex and and uh, more error prone. So in the end, they had to scratch everything wow. and went to something like a state machine. So yeah, I, I try to remember this a lot, uh, not only in game development, but in general development where things sometimes seem very interesting for the developer, but uh, the more valuable thing for the user would be to just like go with something much easier and and simpler. I also think it's always interesting or important to kind of balance this. If uh, you only work on stuff that is interesting for a user, then you probably have a great business, uh, but maybe you as a developer kind of lose yourself in the project. I feel like I, in different projects, I also try to find this balance of, of course, I don't want to just build an engine just to have fun. I want to finish something. But on the other hand, I don't want to do business research all day and uh, do do something that is not fun at all. So yeah. I think finding the balance of having fun yourself and providing something that is fun for the players and users um, is kind of interesting to balance. Yeah. The balance. It's, I, I like that you use the word balance because that's exactly where where it stands. Like like you have all these companies. Again, like Silicon Valley, right? So you have companies like Oracle that definitely don't care about like how much their how much fun that their <laughs> developers have. Uh, on the other hand, like I remember talking to a startup in San Francisco where they would make um, they would make software for like they were like a software studio. They would make software for um, clients and. They would say, "Okay, so we're we're making software only in the most hyped current technologies because we can hire easily for people <laughs> that want to make uh, things in this, and we know that we will be rewriting from scratch in two years anyway. <laughs> so in another technology, because and mm -hmm. that's what was their business model. That's how they may were able to have highly motivated." probably not as well paid developers, but who wanted to be like, oh my God, I can make like a, you know, mobile app in Rust or whatever. And yeah. and they, they did this. And then, you know, two years later, everyone was like, okay, so yeah, this doesn't work. Uh, let, let's try something else. Uh, yeah. Uh, so balance is, is the key. I also think it, it kind of makes sense sometimes and it can also be a competitive advantage because if you like do it from a very technical, from a very businessy perspective, you kind of lose, I feel like, the, the innovation. You kind of go mainstream, you do what everybody else is doing because that makes sense. The data is showing that players like these and these things. But if you kind of try something different that is kind of unique, uh, then I think, yeah, that, that's why the balance. If you do something completely unique that nobody will even understand, that's bad. If you do something that is so generic, everybody has played it tens, yeah. tens of thousands of times before, it's also bad. Yeah, I always, I always also, that, that, that's another thing, uh, again, yeah, with, with game development. I always say, look, the most successful game of all times, Minecraft, was made in a technology that was like, the, if you ask any game developer at the time if it's a good idea to make a 3D game in Java, they would be like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. And 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 yet it's the most, 
you know, I know that they rewrote it, but but the the, the fact that the this 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 guy was able to make make a game that now has like billions of dollars of revenue uh, is probably because that he wasn't afraid to to do something right. to 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 use a technology that was not um, uh, meant for games, but and but he was able to do something with it that that couldn't be done otherwise. Like they they rewrote it in C plus plus. But the real version that all the players uh, still play is the Java version because right. that allows you to do mods. So I actually kind of started with my programming career with creating mods for Minecraft and Java. So we were able to decompile this thing, watch some tutorials and add some new ores and all the fun stuff. Yeah, um, that's exactly it. Yeah, and, the, and see, so that, that's, I think what made Java, I mean, what made Minecraft so... Uh, popular was first of all java allowed him to just put minecraft on a website and so like i remember like the first time i played minecraft was like in a java really? applet in a website <laughs> yeah it was free like the free version was just like you could just like open a website and play mm -hmm. minecraft that was something that no other thing at the time could do and obviously it was something that you could like bring people to, to, to get interested. And second, as you say, it was very easy for, um, for him to, to add mods, uh, and mod support, or, I mean, probably not him. Uh, there was, uh, but anyway, I think uh, people third, just did it. Like yeah, he never really just, supported yeah, people just yes. decompiled because Java exactly. was just yeah, because Java. Yes. And, um, what was the other thing? Yeah. And the, then like, um, uh, I I also heard that the the guy who did this made a terrible job of the software engineering. Like apparently it was terrible. Like the, the you know the like the code was really bad. But that's another thing that I like people to understand that you need to balance this. Like if you yes, there are definitely games out there that are like made in pure functional style and <laughs> everything is beautiful, but nobody plays them. Uh, and yes, there's also games that might have been great, but that have so terrible uh, software engineering practices that they don't even work. Um, so, but you have to kind of balance it because, like, nobody cares about the elegance of your code uh, if you're, you know, if you're five years late after everyone else, or if you don't yeah. finish. Yeah, for sure. I also think this is a very good segue. Also, the Java app thingy. Um, one thing I really like about also Flutter and Dart being able to write games in is that you can run anywhere. You can run on desktop, you can run on mobile, but more importantly, you can also run on web. It's very easy to kind of uh, get something up and running. Um, mm -hmm. What I also really value is you mentioned the for, for the Lander game, you are able to just start it a meeting, you can do a quick quick game, and it starts up quickly. So there's, especially with like, Unity games. I'm not sure. I don't even think Unreal Engine can export to web. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but even with Unity games, they're like it's it does it isn't too bad. But there's still this couple of seconds of loading, and I feel like Flutter has this magic thing. If your game can run or deal with the limitation that it's giving you, it can be really powerful. And I know you have used Star and Flutter a lot. Um, in both of your games, the Giant Robot game and Knights of San Francisco, um, what are your experiences with using something that is traditionally not directly meant for games back in the games? I know nowadays it's being pushed more. How was your experience with it or how is your experience with it? Yeah, well, I, I think I, I always say that uh, Flutter is a great uh, tool for game developers who are kind of software engineer -y. Because there's definitely a kind of game developers who kind of want, uh, you know, Game Maker or, or Unity, where you do a lot of the things with uh, clicking and 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 content, and, and that that makes a lot of sense. A lot of really really good games are are done this way. But then you have all these games like Slay the Spire, Bellatro, um, you know, Papers Please, that that are made by basically software engineers who kind of like, yes, they, they often are also artists, but they, they want to write things down in a, in a code, you know, Pretty and, sure. uh, that, that I'm, I'm one of those people. And I think, uh, with, especially with flame, uh, which is a package for flutter that makes 
uh, making games easier. I think it's basically uh, like 90% of genres out there are possible to make in Flutter. Um, and it uh, and if you are this kind of developer who wants to mostly write code and and not you know play around in an IDE, uh, then uh, I, I think it's 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 a good it's it's a good uh, choice. Uh, that said, I don't want to s- oversell it, right? Like like for a lot of people, uh, this would be like like the obvious choice would be something like Godot or Unity or Unreal especially if you do anything 3D. Um, also not, not a great idea to, to use Flutter, I think. Uh, but but yeah, Flutter is great for making 2D and making UIs. And a lot of games are 2D and UI heavy. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that, that kind of uh, is where it is. Yeah, I th- also think um, it was really fitting where you said it's for software engineers who want to make games instead of like game designers. I did some Unity and Godot before and both are nice. I like them. Like you you have your UI, you can do a lot of things really quickly. Like it has some great tile sheet support. You can add in animations. You can see the stuff right in editor. But I was always a bit annoyed by all the constraints I was given. Like I didn't really like how the component system of Unity, for example, worked or the node scenes. I was always annoyed by why are these, uh, is it no, or it's, uh, it's scenes. I was always annoyed by why a player needs to be a scene. I want it to be like an object, not a scene. Right. And those are the things that you have full control over if you do the code yourself. On the other hand, it's uh, dangerous. I can also say I built a small side project a few years ago where I wanted to have this kind of top-down 2D bullet hell shooter. And I essentially re-implemented everything from scratch in the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was working on an engine. I really like the way that the ECS entity component system was kind of structured. Mm-hmm. I still think it's great, but there were so many simple things that were hard to do, but there were some yeah. hard things that were simple to do. It was kind of in this weird spot. Yeah, ECS, I have two minds about it. Like, like I also got very... Uh, so, so maybe for the uh, for the listener, because we're going v- very like in depth right now. But but ECS Entity Component System is where you have it's a game development paradigm, I guess, where uh, entities are separate from compo- their components and from their systems. So like an entity is just like uh, has basically just an ID, right? So like there's an entity uh, which happens to be player but its uh, ID is 99. And then this entity only has some things attached that are called components. So for example, okay, I'm, a, I'm like, a comp- like wh- wh- what could that be? Uh, you know, I have velocity and I have, uh, you know, I can carry stuff and so on and so forth. And then systems are just functions that take these entities and their components and, and act on them, right? Um, the the original reason why ACS exists is because of um, uh, data locality. It's like mm-hmm. you know, if you have like a huge game with a lot of entities, you want all the all of these things or components right next to each other and just like you know go go through them instead of jumping around the memory. Uh, so in in places like uh, Dart, this doesn't really you know give you much. Uh, but it's an elegant, kind of like an uh, elegant solution. But to be honest, for example, I started uh, Gender Robot Game as an ECS uh, game. And and then I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm yeah. just going to use uh, <laughs> normal, you know, uh, object-oriented programming. And that that has worked for me. Uh, so they, there are, uh, the, the, the thing with ECS is indirection. It's like, you know, sometimes you don't know what actually, ha- where, where this happened. With 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 object oriented programming, it can be good and bad. But the good thing is, often when something breaks, you know exactly where, and it's very easy to do the stack trace mm-hmm. things and 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 know what would happen. With ECS, you're like, okay, this this is broken, but how <laughs> did that data get corrupted? You know, like like why mm-hmm. is this component missing? Uh, and uh, unless you have something like you know, time rewind or whatever, uh, which I don't have, 
then uh, then you're screwed. You don't know what's happened. Yeah, for sure. Like for for some things, it can feel re really elegant, but sometimes the, like the most stupid and simple things, you just want to execute a piece of code when something happens. In a normal object-oriented world, you would have a callback, some collision happened, or something easy done. In ECS, you have to figure out, okay, like I don't have some code running for something. I need to do it through these yeah. components and all these things. Um, but I think it's great to kind of have the perspectives of the different worlds and kind of pick the best of all of them. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, like for example, I I learned the hard way, and I think a lot of programmers learned the hard way, like that you don't want to uh, do the uh, kind of the lecture stuff, like like in computer science where like you know you have a vehicle and then a mm -hmm. car implements a vehicle, and then you know like like just um, inheritance is is useful, but it's often just like. Uh, and, and and elegant. It it sounds very elegant, but then in most cases, it, it's it's just it can be a headache. Like you know, yes. like you want uh, short inheritance structures and uh, composition over inheritance. All these things uh, yeah. that might not seem, you know, like less type safe, I guess, or whatever. But but they're just like more useful. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, inheritance. I I feel like sometimes it's. It's elegant until it isn't. <laughs> yeah, if it goes yeah. too deep and you need to do this one change, all your perfect world assumptions fall apart and you need to do a big refactor. Yeah. Um, is there anything special you are doing in Giant Robot Game um, where you think that um, that's something that you would usually not hear about or... Hmm. So, so first of all, I I wanted the game to look like you know science fictional interfaces from movies, and and a lot of these are uh, kind of um, inspired by old computers. I think you know if you if you look at Batman or um, I, I don't know Star Wars. Uh, their computer interfaces are very kind of old, uh, you, you know, like like black and white or three colors and old 3D. And so for me, I also wanted to do that. And so I uh, had to implement my own 3D uh, kind of renderer, uh, which mm -hmm. I based, to be clear, I, I didn't write it from scratch. I based it on Flutter underscore cube, which is a package, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but I heavily modified it so that it looks like a 1970s um, uh, 3D uh, rendering thing. And uh, to that, uh, I, I learned a lot about like how how to render things in 3D. I guess like you know, on the very very basic level. Uh, I also just this week I made big uh, uh, performance improvement. By basically just like instant, by uh, data locality uh, and and just by you know moving my data about the three D object into a big U, big typed data list mm -hmm. uh, and just keep it in there, which makes it very mm -hmm. you know like non darty non you know <laughs> it's like all you rewrite things on the fly and. And it's uh, but but it's it's fast and and it uh, doesn't consume memory, so so I did that um, uh, and that taught me a lot about kind of low level programming um, or I don't know if it taught me a lot but but I after a long time I I had the chance to to practice it which was nice, um, but uh, I think the most interesting thing that I uh, learned. Um, is marching squares uh, and actually implementing marching squares, which is where you have some kind of like a field. Like for in my game, it's smoke, right? So you have like a high definition smoke uh, throughout the map. And that is very variable. Like the smoke is, uh, there's winds and, and little abbeys and everything. Uh, and you have to, or I, I uh, decided to um, to to show it as vectors because the whole game is kind of vector graphics based, right? And mm -hmm. so for that, that's that's a great uh, thing for uh, for marching squares. And I realized that Dart, despite 
being pretty high level programming language is fast enough to to do this um and uh and so uh i'm actually looking forward to moving more of the systems into marching squares because it just first of all it looks nicer and also it kind of erases the the fact that there are tiles in the game and uh which makes it more simulationy uh because you're you're less likely to to notice that oh this is like okay i'm on a tile and and that other mm -hmm. person is on a tile no it's just a battleground and uh things are you know moving around so so yeah so uh marching squares is um and uh, by the way i also thought about hey marching squares would be really cool for the lander game uh if i and with having uh um you know the terrain being dynamic and being able to like drill down and you know <laughs> making explosions like that would be really fun mm -hmm. um so so yeah marching squares S sign me up for that <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So I think we're slowly approaching the end of the episode. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about, or you have on well, your do, mind? Do you want to do you want to talk about your games? I I don't I didn't want to like uh, you know switch sides, but uh, <laughs> I would be interested. Um, well, it was mostly a couple of small prototypes, um, which I've kind of tested on myself and also on a couple of friends, and they never reached kind of the the um, the, the response or like the fun level I was hoping for. So it was like a small project, which I don't consider a fail because most of, of them not. were like one or two week projects where I, I tried something. So I had this one game where um, also a very similar uh, idea that you have with your lander, something that you can pl play throughout the day, something that doesn't require a lot of attention, but can kind of give you a bit of fun here and there. So I, one prototype was what if I took Minecraft and just cut everything out that was in the UI. <laughs> so basically Minecraft without Minecraft. So I had the small <laughs> kind of idle game where you would cook stuff, you would craft stuff and everything would take time. So you would queue your cookings, you could close the browser tab, you could come back like an hour later and you had, I don't know, some fish ready, uh, which you could then nice. use to, to, to eat during mining and so on. Um, of course, I, I, I didn't publish it. I just reused uh, Minecraft assets for that. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Wow. <laughs> so that was one small prototype I did. And the other was a very interesting genre, which I I think I read online or read somewhere. It was, I, I tried if an idle game and a deck builder game could fit together. Mm. So where you would have a deck builder, a typical, where you would play cards, you would could damage monsters, something along the lines of Slay the Spire, but something that plays itself. So you essentially, you do not play the cards yourself, but you just design the deck. You design the type of deck you want to play against a certain type of monster, and you would try to maximize your efficiency. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, so I actually had a very, I would say, high fidelity prototype which was, I think I set a deadline for two weeks. Um, maybe I'll share it at some point. Um, uh, it wasn't really too much fun. Um, it was all right, but yeah, game design kicked. I was like, I have this issue, I have this issue, I have this issue. I don't know how to fix it. Um, yeah, I think I, I will probably release it uh, you should. Uh, in the next yeah, couple you of weeks. Yeah. It's 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 kind of polished. It's written in Flutter, also with the idea of exporting to Flutter Web, which is just so accessible. For example, if you post your game on itch.io, which is the site where people can download and play games. When I go on this site to kind of get inspiration or see what other people are building, if I see a download link for, I'm most on Mac, so most of the games only support Windows. Yeah. Um, but like, if there is a game that I can just click one button and play right away, the chances of me doing that is like exponentially higher than kind of downloading something, installing it, like trusting the person that this is all right yes. to download. Um, so, yeah, I also have another, uh, like a couple of other game ideas or themes like you have with the, the text-based stuff, which mm -hmm. would be a whole other topic to dive in. So uh, maybe maybe another episode, but that those two were sure. my more recent ones, which I think I worked on a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, that's great. I, I I like that you you know like I I really um, 
appreciate when people have side projects when they actually not just think about them but actually like implement them even if that you don't need to of course finish everything that you start but like just like you know putting them into a state where you know that it would work or not is is really really cool and i would really definitely like to, to see the <laughs> that game especially if it's a web game i'm actually yes. looking at like you know a flutter versus um you know unity and godot uh this is something that uh, you will hopefully see you know in the next week or two uh like a kind of trying to benchmark where flutter is in comparison to these and mm -hmm. uh, on the web obviously like the startup times uh and the requirements for yeah. for the server are completely different like a flutter game can start even like on a slow connection in a few seconds a godo game you have to have a special server uh that does the you know shared array buffer thing and it oh. takes mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it downloads even if it's a very small game it downloads like 60 megs or of something you know so so looking at especially these like little games on the web i think is uh, uh is a kind of superpower for flutter yeah uh, so for it, sure. yeah yeah cool i agree yeah so i think uh we're pretty much done how can people follow what you're doing you said something about a giant robot game um coming to some playtesting states how can people True. who are interested yes. um yes. You get to know more well uh thanks for asking that by the way <laughs> but uh but yeah there is uh if you just go to giantrobotgame.com uh there is a link to steam uh which is probably where the 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 main or only place where i will be kind of uh making the game available so if you're on steam you can already you know uh, put it into your wish list or whatever uh, there's also a link to a Discord server where I talk to like the people who are like really interested in this and really want to keep in touch. Uh, and uh, otherwise, philiph.net is is my site where you know I have a bunch of I I need to make uh, uh, hard decisions because I have way too many things where you can follow me. <laughs> uh from from mastodon twitter uh, i have a mailing list and whatnot uh but yeah i take your pick i will i will uh keep you updated people can just follow you on all of those sites so don't worry True. <laughs> yeah. i know but uh, I, for me it's kind of hard to, to even like remember all all these all right. places where i need to update yeah cool awesome. man uh thanks that was this was fun awesome to hear the next uh uh next um episode for sure thanks so much for being here it was a really fun episode to to record together and thanks everybody else for listening and see you next time all right and that's it i hope you liked it i did enjoy it and uh see you next time